had the privilege of filming this video on Wajat Noongar land, I'd like to pay my respects to Wajat Noongar people and their elders, past, present and upcoming. The bulk of this video is designed to share poses to free up energy in the body and to introduce the body to the subtler aspects of, of yoga. To complement that, I'll begin with some theory about subtlety and why it's important. But first, I'd just like to speak to why this video is being made in tandem with the Kickstart Youth Festival. The Youth Festival has always been about fostering community participation and connection, but this is especially true this year of Kickstart Virtual. Kickstart Virtual is creating a unique environment for people to share their creativity with one another, and it's encouraging us all to find new ways to do so, new ways to communicate. It's fitting that yoga should be involved in this environment, because if there's one thing that's true of yoga, it's that it's an incredibly complex medium of communication. And the kind of communication it engages in depends on what its students need at any given time. To sense what I'm getting at, consider reading a book. The meaning you'll get out of a book will depend on what's going on in your life at the time that you're reading it. Now, this kind of intuitive reading is a really wonderful thing, but it's not always the easiest thing to achieve. We have to be open to it. And often, whether we're aware of it or not, our minds are closed. We perceive our thoughts as being private, and creating an internal monologue. But really, those thoughts, requests, and expectations and fears they're being transmitted subtly far beyond our own minds. They're opening up a dialogue with the universe. It sounds naff, but the universe will reply. And as its response, it will infuse the book or the yoga mat, or whatever it is that's your teacher in that moment, with a meaning that is tailored to the thoughts that you're transmitting. But if you aren't open to listening to what the universe has to say, you may miss it. It may deliver the mail to an unmarked address. So how can you receive it? By being present. Presence is the most essential ingredient of good communication, irrespective of time or place. And it also happens to be the most essential ingredient of yoga. As Swami Veda Bharati, one of the beloved senior teachers of my tradition says, being present now is the gap between sensation and thought. It is through presence that we may achieve union of body and mind and perhaps union of our spirit with something beyond ourselves, if we're so inclined. Now, I haven't gone on this tangent to scare anyone away or to confuse you. I've just done it to invite some mindfulness, yes, that buzzword, into the act of exercising, so that we can see it as less command-driven and more feedback-driven. Mindfulness is crucial for nonviolence, or ahimsa. Nonviolence is the first of the five introductory philosophical foundations for yoga. As students, we must always remember to be nonviolent with ourselves. And then, of course, with others to avoid violence, that means that our physical posture, our asana, does not look the way the person's next to us does, then so be it. Because fundamentally, yoga is awareness based and not performance based. Now, before we get into some poses, I have a few basic rules to protect us and to ensure that we're using our bodies in the most loving and efficient way that we can. In the Himalayan tradition, we use inhalations to do movements which require more effort than others, especially those working against gravity, like raising limbs. And we use exhalations for movements which come quite naturally with the flow of gravity, and which then for, therefore tend to release tension. But when I say release, I don't mean to sigh out an exhalation or to fling the limbs to let go of tension we've accumulated. Although relaxing, an exhalation should be as mindful as an inhalation. We don't want to become lazy or sleepy, but conversely, we don't want to become exhausted. We're aiming to balance these two states to achieve an optimal state of mindfulness and physical stability. It's this optimal state that encourages the meditation that is yoga. Sometimes people forget this aim and they focus on the activating exercises because these make them fit. But this can neglect the gentle movements that we're about to do, and these are crucial. Without them, the full potential of exercise can't be tapped. Joints and glands are tiny spots where channels of energy meet. They must be unblocked. Otherwise, while we're exercising and we're generating a lot of energy, that energy can't be transported in the way it's supposed to be. This can create blockages, which can create soreness, 
which can create violence. And remember what Ahimsa tells us is that where there is violence, there is no yoga. Finally, the last note to make before we begin is to breathe naturally and at your own pace. It's tricky for teachers because we have to keep a sense of time and structure for the class, but really we want to be flexible enough so that you can follow the rhythm of your own breathing. Where it's possible, go with your own flow. And if you're running a little behind time, don't worry, because after each pose, there's time for pausing and reflecting. That's where you'll have a moment to catch up with the rest of us. Or if you're a little faster, you can have some extra time to lean into a reflection step. And as we go through the sequence of poses, I'll just briefly dot in some theory about six steps to do asanas or poses meditatively. So the first step is centering. Centering happens where we're in a symmetrical and comfortable position. So for example, the seat that I was just sitting in, or if that type of seat is uncomfortable for you, then maybe sitting with the legs folded beneath you, Sitting up like this, especially in between this. If it's getting sore, you can pop up between sitting back down. Or of course, sitting on a chair. Even though we're inclined to think of the body as being natural, a chair is perfectly natural if it's what you need to feel comfortable. The biggest thing that we want is to avoid violence. As I said, it's the first step of those ethical and philosophical foundations of yoga. The first pose that we're going to be doing is crocodile pose. So to begin crocodile pose, we'll start our centering in all fours. For all fours, line your knees beneath the hip points and the wrists between beneath the shoulders, just like this. This is just to give you a sense of the symmetry of the body. Then begin to move the hands toward the front of the mat and the feet toward the back. And slowly, using your arm strength, just lower yourself down. Now, you can use the edges of the mat as a good indication of where you want your legs to be. They have some room between one another. Then with the arms, you're going to bring the right elbow toward the right corner of the mat and the left toward the left corner. Then lay the arms flat, parallel to the front of the mat. And you're going to put the right hand on top of the left elbow and the left hand on top of the right. Now just checking in, what we want to look for is that we're not craning our backs or necks in this way. We're only risen off the floor with the support of our arms so that we can get a flow of breath just in this region here from the rib cage up because this region is where the diaphragm is. And what we're looking for in crocodile pose is to get a really nice deep diaphragmatic breath. And that's the only intention of the pose. So when you're ready and you're comfortable, just release the forehead to the uppermost arm. You may notice that this is not the most comfortable position for your head to be in. There's a bit of pressure being created by the, by the top arm and the forehead. This is okay as long as it's not creating a huge amount of pain. A small amount of discomfort is to be expected at first. When you're here, just begin to notice the breath. While we're noticing, we don't want to be judging. It's just a loving act of speculation, of observation, noticing the natural rhythm. You'll find that this simple loving act actually encourages the breath to slow down very naturally, just by watching it. As you begin to become comfortable in the pose, draw your attention to the nostrils. Feel the air as it travels in and out of the nostrils. Is it warm? Is it dense?
gently encourage the breath to grow more quiet, more soft, and longer. As you become aware of the nostrils, slowly shift attention to the nasal region, just around the belly button. Feel the pressure of the nasal region against the mat or the ground as you inhale. And feel that tension release as you exhale. Inhale, belly expands. Exhale, it gently contracts. Without disturbing the quality of the breath, gently lift the forehead off the upper arm. Bring the arms out in front of your face. You can open your eyes if you'd like to watch and create a little triangle with the thumbs and pointer fingers in front of you. Release the elbows out a little wider, edges of the mat are a good indication. Then turn the face toward the left and release the right cheek to the ground. This is a more relaxed variation of crocodile pose, but we are still observing the same qualities we just developed in the first variation. So once you're comfortable in this version of crocodile pose, just again, remember your diaphragmatic breathing and pay attention to that channel from the nostrils to the nasal and from the nasal to the nostrils. Again, without disturbing your relaxation, just slowly lift the head off the ground, turn to face the right hand side, and release the left cheek to the ground. Now without lifting the arms off the floor, just trace them down along the ground until they reach beside the hips or upper legs, and raise the palms to the ceiling. Let them relax here by your sides. Now with the legs, slowly bring them together so that the toes face one another and the heels face out. If this is uncomfortable for you, you can remain in the first leg variation. This again should feel very relaxed. It's another variation of crocodile pose, so we're still maintaining the focus on our diaphragmatic breathing. Now, once again, without jerking the body around or disturbing the breath, just gently bring the left arm overhead, still on the floor. And with the left palm on the floor and the right palm on the floor, turn so that you're on your left, the left hand side of your body. 
and then hike your knees up toward the chest and stabilize here so that you can observe a final few breaths before we exit this first pose. The right arm can either lie on the right hand side of the body or just in front, wherever is comfortable for you. Then, when you're ready, using the support of both palms, gently lift yourself back up to a comfortable seat. Even if you need to open your eyes as we're moving between variations of poses, just try to keep a soft quality about them. Now the aim of crocodile pose that we've just been doing is to establish a really loving relationship with our diaphragmatic breathing and fundamentally to become aware. You may notice that when you first enter the pose, you're breathing a little heavily, a little loudly, or maybe a bit jagged even. And by the end, things may have gotten a little silkier, a little smoother. What you wanna be trying to do is get into that silky smooth breath as much as you can throughout the practice. This applies to this practice we're about to do, which is gentle, or to more vigorous exercise. Of course, there are times where we'll be quite highly stimulated and our breath will correspond to that. But we want in general to be able to return to our centering and to realign with that deep diaphragmatic breathing quite quickly. If you can't return to that breath, to the deep breath quite quickly, it may be an indication that you've just pushed yourself a little too hard. So just remember to be honest with yourself and keep a genuine conversation, a genuine dialogue going on. Now, the next thing we're going to be doing is from head to toe, just tensing and relaxing the body. We'll do this through a sequence of joints and glance movements, and we'll start with the face. So before we do, just bring the palms out in front of you, clasp them together, and just begin to make some heat. If it's hot where you are, like it is here, then you won't need to do much. Otherwise, just take your time. And as you're ready, using the tips of the fingers, you're just going to gently pat the skull from the front to the back. Now there's no right or wrong way to do this, but just try to get a good amount of coverage on the skull. Also, you don't want to be hurting yourself. You don't want to be tapping too heavily, but also you do want to be activating. So apply enough pressure that you do feel a reaction. When you're satisfied, just with whatever fingers feel natural, generally it's the thumb and the pointer finger, grip the ears. So again, you don't want to be hurting yourself, but you want to be activating. So apply enough pressure that reaches a good balance for you and just pull the ears outward and down. Then using these same fingers, the thumb and the pointer finger, we're going to start massaging our eyebrows. So starting from the inner eyebrow toward the temple. And we'll just do most of these movements three times. The next we're going to do is a science massage. So just using the pointer fingers, what you're going to do is trace a line from where we began that last one, the inside of the eyebrow, down along the bony structure of the nose, not front way so that you obstruct the nostril, but around like a triangle. Then you're gonna follow that line down toward the dimples. And when you reach this point, back up along the cheekbone. Then return to the center and begin again, two more times. So remember, follow the pace of your own breathing. Exhalation, down motion. Inhalation, up motion. Next, you're just gonna create a peace finger, flip it forward in both hands. 
and just begin to apply some gentle pressure to the outer edges of the wrist. So what we're going to do first is just up and down movements, but don't exert yourself to a point where you're stressing or straining the eyes. We just want to reach a comfortable edge. So when you're coming down, you're aiming to look at your belly button. And then when you're going up, you're aiming to look at your forehead. So remember, exhalation is a down motion. Inhalation is an up motion. Just one more at the pace of your breath. The next inhalation, just return to center and then begin side to side. So three times both sides. Just begin to blink the eyes quite fast, if you can, before squinting them shut, holding the squint there, and releasing. And next we're going to do some movements with the mouth. Now remember that you're at home alone, well, potentially alone, so don't be afraid. It doesn't matter how your face looks, it's about how it feels. We're aware in a space. So for these next ones, when I'm asking you to stick the tongue out, go for it. So before we begin with the tongue, we're just going to use the mouth and open it nice and wide with the teeth exposed. So on an inhalation, you're going to open as much as you can. And exhalation, close. Two more just like that at your own pace. Now on the next one, on the inhalation, you're going to do the same movement, but incorporate sticking your tongue out. So when you're ready, inhale. Exhale, release, and two more at your own pace. Turn to neutral. Just close your eyes and notice how the face feels. Try to feel as subtly as you can. Tiny little vibrations in the face. So changes in heat, changes in the quality of the skin. How do you feel? Then as you're ready, opening the eyes. And we're going to move to the neck. Now, we're going to proceed with a bit of caution with the neck because 
Although we tend to jerk it around a little bit, it's actually a super sensitive part of the body. And it's no surprise because the neck and shoulders do so much work for us and they tend to store a lot of tension. So we want to be as loving as we can. Remember that the neck isn't a ball joint, so it's not like a knee. It has tiny little muscles that are supporting its movement. You can't just throw it around. So in particular, I want you to think about when I tell you to throw your, not throw, move your neck back. I don't mean jerk it back. I mean, raise the chin to the crease of the, back of the wall in front of you and the roof. Or that's a general indication, this kind of diagonal line. So the chin shouldn't really be going beyond about this angle. Even if it can, even if you're quite flexible and strong, there's not really a need to when we're doing joints in the glands because these are subtle exercises. It's about the small energetic impacts, especially accumulated over time. Then when we're dropping the neck, we're tucking the chin into the chest, just like this. So when you're ready, on an inhalation, chin towards the back crease. Exhalation, chin towards the chest. Two more, just like that, at your own pace. Return to center before beginning left to right. So for this next one, a cool trick is visualization. Some of us have a lot of soreness in the neck. So even a simple, well, what may seem to be a simple movement like turning the head left or right can actually create quite a bit of stress in the upper neck. This is especially true when we're having a really deep listening conversation with our bodies because we're noticing a lot more pain than we're perhaps inclined to notice in our day to day. So with that in mind, try to visualize a little bit beyond your physical capacity today. So if you have your eyes closed, you may think that your nose is tra tracing quite far over the shoulder, even if it can only get about here. You'll visualize it being here. That's actually really handy because it almost tricks the body in the long run into becoming that mobile, becoming that flexible and strong. So don't be disheartened by the fact that maybe your mobility isn't as broad as you thought it would be today. Use the visualization to trace where you'll be in the future. It's also a really lovely way of keeping track of your goals and hopefully keeping you coming back to the mat. So with that in mind, as you're ready, you're just gonna do three on each side. Starting with the left side. as you're ready back to center. Again, just stay centered here as you notice the impact of those neck movements. And slowly open your eyes. And we're gonna come up to standing. But seeing as we've been sitting for quite a long time, whether it was in a chair or on the floor, or in any way, our legs are probably going to be a little bit more tired than we may expect. 
Even if they're not, it's just nice to give yourself a bit of support as you're coming up to standing. So using the support of your palms and your arm strength, or whatever it may be that's near you, if you have a table, just push yourself up gently to come to standing. When you're here, just check in. Make sure that your hips are over the ankles or thereabouts, and that your shoulders are nice and drawn back. Now the shoulders are what we're focusing on next. So we're going to begin by shrugging up on an inhalation and down on an exhalation. Two more times at your own pace. And remember when you're comfortable with the movements, feel free to close your eyes and just look inward. Turn the shoulders to neutral, then raise the arms horizontally out by your sides, palms facing down. You're just going to make really small rotations, so you can start by bringing the palms back and then front. And we'll do this 10 times, but go quite slowly. As you do this, you may like, like to think of your arms being pulled out. If you think of them moving outward, it creates a little bit more of a subtle energy in the shoulders. After the 10th rotation frontwards, change directions and roll them back. your own pace. We're just going to swing out the arms to release some of the tension we've created. So bringing the right arm on top of the left, just a flat motion like that, back out to the sides, then the left on top. Two more times, right on top, left on top, right on top, left on top and back out to the sides. Now note that I haven't told us to release our arms. I want to remain in quite a challenging pose here just to make us think about the second step of doing poses meditatively which is entering. So in the entering step we're establishing an objective like I will do this movement for 10 seconds or I will repeat this 10 times. It's quite handy having an objective, especially when we're about to do something a little challenging, because it will keep the mind anchored. It will keep it concentrated. Sometimes if all we can think is, oh, I'm sore, I'm sore, I want to let go, we can't actually pay attention, we can't become mindful. So if we have an objective, then our minds are kind of tricked, in a way, into obedience. So the objective of the next one is to do 10 elbow bends. So you're just going to bring your hands toward the shoulders and then back out. That's one. So nine more at your own pace. back out to the sides, flip the palms back to face below, and you're just going to curl your fingers in to create a fist. Hold the fist, then release and stretch the fingers. Two more times just like that. So 
here like this. Stretch the fingers. Curling the twist. And stretch the fingers. Now, we're going to speed up this movement. We're still not dropping our arms, I hope. So, bring them in and out. Increase the speed. Now, as you do this movement, begin to raise your arms over your head. Pulsing, pulsing, pulsing. Overhead. Now, dropping in front. And now, release. Now, close your eyes and just feel. Now, we will talk about step three, which is refinement. Refinement allows us to ask some big questions of our body to make sure it isn't doing anything it shouldn't be. So you'll notice now that there's quite a bit of energy pulsing from the fingers to the shoulders. And even though that's a lot of energy, it shouldn't be pain. If there's discomfort, this is okay, but there's definitely a distinction between the discomfort and pain. So a way, a good way to think about whether we're going to encounter pain is if our body is doing something that comes way too unnaturally to it, that may, may either be our biology or because we're just not flexible on any given day. So the refinement step, step three, is really important to do each and every time you return to the mat and with each and every pose. You don't want to be complacent and think, oh, one day I'm really good at doing this. So the following day, of course, I'll be able to do it. It's amazing how different the subtle workings of our bodies are each day. Sometimes they just don't want to do things. So big things to look out for when we're refining a pose are what is our spine doing and what are our extremities doing in relation to their bases. So by extremities, I mean fingers or hands, toes or feet. So for example, what is my hand doing in relation to my shoulder? Does it feel like they're quite out of line? Do I feel like I'm ruining the natural progression from shoulder to hand? Or what is my foot doing in relation to my hip? Is there something going on with my knee? Am I twisting it unnaturally? There should generally be quite a strong and structural line from the hip to the foot. And we, unless explicitly advised to do this by a teacher, we generally don't want to disrupt that kind of natural strength and points of reference between the hip and the foot. And the back, a good way to determine whether our back is doing the right thing is by measuring the natural lumbar curve. So you can open your eyes if they're not already and just replicate this at home. So what I do to determine is just to make a little fist with my right or my left hand and put it at the base of my spine. I'll hold my front, my belly with the other hand just to keep me supported so that I can really be honest about the curve. It's very different for everyone. So just notice, what does it feel like? About how much give do you have? Can a full fist fit between there? Or is it just maybe an open hand? Whatever it is, just keep that in mind. And every time someone tells you in yoga or in any exercise for that matter, to keep your back straight, they actually mean to keep your back in alignment with its natural lumbar curve. So in any pose when we're refining, just ask, how does my spine feel in relation to that general natural curvature? A good way to check this is side bends. So even though, again, this might seem to be a simple movement, it actually creates a lot of subtle movement in the spine. And we wanna keep it as supported as we can, especially at the point where the neck becomes involved. So sometimes people have an inclination when they're doing a side bend to push the hips out of line and to swing the neck. Two things we don't wanna be doing. Rather, we wanna be using a nice and strong core and back to make sure that our hips stay in line and we're only twisting with our spine. And the neck is an extension of the spine, so it's staying in line. 
So to do this movement, you're going to start in standing before then raising one arm up overhead. I'm raising my right. And before even beginning to bend, imagine someone pulling your fingertips upward. This activates the right side body. So we can use this side body to give us some more muscular support for the spine. Then slowly on an exhale, begin to bend toward the left. Notice my neck. And once you're here at your comfortable edge, just breathe. We'll do three cycles of breath at your own pace. Again, on an inhalation, exit the same way we came in, in inverted. So that means bringing the right arm back up along with the spine, dropping that right arm down and returning to standing. Close the eyes and feel the side body. You may feel a rush of energy in the right hand side. If you don't feel a rush, it's also perfectly fine. Over time, we develop these subtle listening skills. Then when you're ready, opening the eyes again, if you like, or if you're super comfortable with it, keep them closed. <laughs> so raise the left arm, again, nice and slowly, always mindful, overhead. Before you begin to bend, imagine those, those fingertips being pulled upward, activate the left side body, and then on an exhalation, Bend right. When you're at your comfortable edge, three cycles of breath at your pace. is a good example or a good opportunity to talk about steps four and five. Step four is a really simple one, well, theoretically at least, it's holding. So basically the only really important thing I have to say about holding is that we're holding a pose and not our breath. So remember what I mentioned at the start, if we're finding that we're panting or that we're having a lot of trouble to return to our deep and diaphragmatic breathing, we may have pushed things a little bit too far. So you want to use your breath as a nice guide of how much you should be holding a pose. So that means duration and also intensity. So hold according to what your breath is telling you to do. If you feel, even if I'm doing something for longer than you feel comfortable doing and your breath is irritated, your breath is telling you, I'm done. I have to stop holding and that's totally fine. But then you have to be mindful when you're turning into step five, which is coming out. And the reason it's super important to be mindful in step five, other than because it's yoga and we should always be mindful, is because injuries are most likely to occur when we're exiting a pose. So because we're moving against gravity quite often when we're exiting, there's a bit more effort required. So we're having to use the activating inhalation and we're also generating a little bit more heat and in those situations our body is more sensitive to being injured so the next movement is a standing forward bend it's really simple but it can show you based on what we were discussing about the spine how if we rush out we can injure ourselves so to enter just watch before you actually replicate this one because i'll show you what not to do when coming out so to enter, it's a simple slow release. We'll do this slower when we're doing it together, like this. But say I hold, held it for too long and I'm really struggling and I want to just rush out. What I may be inclined to do is just do this. 
kind of rush out. And you'll notice that my back curved as I came up. I've lost the integrity of my spine. And as I'm doing that, I can create tension in my neck, in my shoulders, in my lower back. There are all kinds of points along that spine that could have been injured because I was rushing. So steps four and five, I feel are quite closely linked. So now we'll actually do it together. I will stand to the side so that you can see if you need to. But now that you know generally what the, what the movement is, which is just getting the body parallel to the floor, try to do it so that your neck is facing front rather than facing me. You want to be in line. Holding the hands to the hips, take an inhalation in first, and on an exhalation, with a nice strong core and back, bringing the body in a flat plane as close as you can to parallel to the floor. Even if that's nowhere near the floor, it's totally fine. What we're looking for is that natural lumbar curve. Just holding for one more breath cycle. And on an inhalation, just as slowly, exit mindfully. So when we're exiting slowly, we remember to engage our core, to engage our legs, engage our back, all the necessary body, thing, body parts that are going to support us. Now facing front again, close the eyes, feel the effect. Where is the energy changing, if at all? Then gently open the eyes and move to the legs. So before we begin the legs, always remember how it feels to be standing squarely with the hips over the ankles. In general, we don't want to be spilling out one side or the other. Of course, there are exceptions if you have injuries, but as much as you can, try to keep an equal balance between the right side and the left. So to begin, we're going to lift our right leg slightly up. Doesn't matter if it's up here or down here, wherever is comfortable for you. Then once we're here comfortably, making sure that we have a good amount of strength in the left leg so that, we're, so that our hip isn't spilling out one way or the other, we want to be straight. Begin to cycle the leg. We'll do it three times, one way and then the other. Nice and slow. Now change the direction. And if you ever need to put your foot down, please feel free to do it. Remember, it's not about performance, it's about awareness. And as you're ready, drop that foot down. Close the eyes and feel the right hand side. Then gently open the eyes again, or keeping them closed if you're comfortable. And lift the left leg. Same thing on this side. First, just establish a bit of strength in the right leg. Check whether you're spilling to the right or the left. And try as best you can stand up straight so that the hips are square. Then when you're ready, begin cycling three times in one direction and then the other. When you've completed the last three, pop that leg down. Close the eyes and feel. Slowly opening the eyes. The next movement is similar, but what we're going to be doing is shifting the leg from in to out. So it looks like this. Lifting first, establishing balance. Then the movement is like three times at your own legs. Then 
reverse it three more times. Don't forget, you can always hit the floor with your feet if you need to. And release. Close the eyes and feel. In particular, notice the difference between the sides when you've only done one, so that then when you've done both sides, you can feel the difference. When you're ready, lifting the left leg, and that same motion, in to out, three times, at your own pace. Or reversing it three times. the arms by the sides, feel the legs, and open the eyes, we'll move to the knees. Now the knees are a bit of a tricky one to exercise actually, we don't have anything major, all we have is small circles, and the reason that we're going to be making small circles is because we're doing a big movement like this, generally it's the other muscles of the leg that are actually stepping in. And we want to really concentrate as much as we can on the knees. So to facilitate that, you're just going to create a really slight bend, just like this, and then begin circling. We'll do 10 one way and then the other. And then when you finish those, straighten out and bend again. Let's do that three times. Then return to neutral. Again, close the eyes, feel the legs. Slowly opening, then we'll move to the ankles. So again, there's no need to be overperforming. When we're lifting the legs, we don't have to have them really high. We just want to have them in a nice stable position so that we can focus on the ankle rather than the other muscle groups. So if you're finding that you've lifted the leg all the way up here and you're tensing all these muscles to do so, your ankle is really not getting as much energy as it could. Think about it simply. If you're activating all the other muscle groups, there's a lot of energy involved and the body doesn't have as much to send to the subtle areas. So if you need to even hold the wall to lift the foot, totally fine. Whatever feels comfortable for you. So lifting the right leg first, we're just going to make some circles. So using the toe as the pointers, just going to make six, nice and slow. We have six, change the direction. Returning to neutral. Up and down three times. Before releasing, close the eyes, feel the legs. Especially notice how the right ankle feels in comparison to the left, which we haven't yet exercised. Then on the next inhalation, lift the left leg and begin with six circles, one arm. Reverse it. 
back to neutral, up and down three times. Then release that leg, close the eyes, and feel. is for the toes. So starting with the right leg, again lifting it with the support that you need. And we're just going to flex the toes on an inhalation and tense them in for an exhalation. Stretch and in. One more time. Stretch. the eyes, feel the toes, then lifting the left leg, again on an inhalation, stretching, exhalation in, two more times at your own pace. Foot back to the ground, return to standing, close the eyes. Now that we've completed the sequence from the head to toes, it's time to think about step six. Step six is for observation and reflection. Of course, We've been observing and reflecting the whole way through our practice, but the key thing to remember is that we're not judging. We're playing the observer in the most neutral way that we can. And if possible, quite a loving way, like you'd be watching a child play or someone experiment. But we wanna do so consciously. We wanna have an expanded consciousness. So it's not about being sleepy and using the end of the pose to forget about what you've just done. You actually want to trace it. You want to think, what just happened? How do I feel now compared to how I began? So always direct attention to even the smallest details you can, the smallest fibers of your body. And even if you can't physically feel them, visualize feeling them. Use your imagination. What might it feel like? What color might be there? What pattern might live inside that small part of the body? You can be very, intimate and personal with it. Treat your body however you would like to, but be comfortable and honest with it as much as you can. Now with that in mind, just stand in the standing pose and feel, really deeply, deeply feel. If it makes you laugh, it's totally fine. If it makes you feel really happy, that's great. If it makes you feel sad, that's also great. These are all important things to feel and it just goes to show that when we're really still and we're just alone with our own bodies, how much comes up. Now if the mind's gone wandering beyond the deep listening, the internal listening. Just use the breath to reel it back in, like the string is reeling in a kite. Slowly open the eyes, and in the same gentle way that we rose from the from the floor, we want to come back down to it. So use whatever support you have around you to gently come back down into a seat. And we're just transitioning through the seat before we come to corpse pose. So you're going to let your legs 
come out in front of you. Again, using the corners or the edges of the mat as a reference point for the legs. But for some bodies, the legs will be further apart and for others, they're a bit closer. But in general, you don't wanna be having the limbs too close to the body. You wanna have some breathing room between each body part. Now shuffle the bum down the mat if you're tall, if you need to. And then slowly using your arm strength, release down to the mat and allow the arms to fall gently by the sides. Now shuffle around as you need to to become comfortable. If it's cold in the room that you're in, grab a blanket, cover yourself up. Some people like to put something in their eyes and their feet. Any sensitive spots for you. Just give them the love that they need so that you can really feel comfortable here. This is really the time where we're giving ourselves permission to pause. Just to lie in here with the support of the earth beneath us and our breaths to remind us of just how alive we really are. Now, there is an obvious temptation to let the mind wander, whether that's to the things that we have to do next, the things we've done in the past. So I invite you to just trace some concentration from the top of the head to the toes and encourage each part of the body to relax. You may do this just by breathing into the body, into each different part, or by visualizing a light flame from the crown of the head to the tip of the toes. However you choose to relax, just remember to keep an awareness of the breath. Observing the deep relaxation, introduce some subtle movements at different angles to the body. Of course, stretching the arms overhead, full body stretching, reaching to either end of the room. Then keep the left arm overhead, but release the right arm in front of the body from the left hand side of the body leg and turn to the left side as we did when we were coming out of course like a crocodile pose right at the start of the practice so hike the knees up toward the chest for support and then using the palms on the floor push slowly and gently back up to a comfortable seat
keep your eyes closed if you can and listen. And just take a few gentle, loving breaths. Acknowledge the tradition in yoga to send some love out to the world. We have plenty of it to give, and it's a lovely act of humility, just remembering our connection to those around us. So as a gesture of doubt, just bring the hands together in front of the face or in front of the heart. Cup the eyes with the palm. Blink a few times beneath the palm. And then release the hands. Thanks for watching the vi video <laughs> with me and for being a part of Kickstart Virtual in general. I hope you enjoy every beautiful offering it has for you.